Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word and for the privilege we have to study together. We pray that the Holy Spirit will uh, capture our attention and Jesus Christ will be seen again because in his name we pray, amen. Before reading some sections from Genesis 10 and 11, I would like to go through this parallelism that you have on your worksheet. You should have it on your worksheet. Between the fall and what I call the new fall, then between Adam's sons and Noah's sons, then we have sin and justice on one side and sin and justice on the other side. So, if you look carefully, you will see that we have some very strong parallel features between the story of the fall, as it is described in Genesis chapters 2 and 3, and the new fall in Genesis chapter 9. This is what happens. In Genesis chapters 2 and 3, the first humans eat, right? Then in Genesis chapter 9, Noah is the one that drinks. Then nakedness follows. Adam and Eve, because of eating, become what? Naked. Noah drinks wine, of course, alcohol, obviously. And he becomes naked. In both scenarios, their nakedness is seen. In Adam and Eve's case, they see their own nakedness. In the case of Noah, one of his sons sees his nakedness. Then we have nakedness covered. In the case of Adam and Eve, they try to cover their nakedness. And then God covers their nakedness. In the case of Noah, two of his sons, not Ham, the other two, Japheth and Shem, come backwards, right, and cover Noah's nakedness. Then we have curse in both cases. In the first case, God pronounces a curse on the serpent, and the ground is cursed because of Adam and uh, Eve's rebellion. In the case of uh, Noah, Noah pronounces a curse upon who? You would expect him to pronounce that curse upon Ham, his son, and yet the curse goes to his grandson, Canaan, or Canaan in Hebrew. Let's move one step further. Adam's sons are parallel to Noah's sons. Adam, right in the beginning, has Cain and Abel, and then Seth is being born, right? Abel dies without descendants. Cain is the rebellious guy. Seth is faithful, and out of Seth... Ten generations go all the way down to Noah. So between Adam and Noah, we have ten generations. That's very interesting. If you go to Noah's sons, you will see he has three sons, Japheth, Ham, and Shem, right? Japheth, we don't know too much about him from the description. Ham is the rebellious guy parallel to Cain. Shem is the faithful one, it looks like, because from him, again, we have 10 generations all the way down to Terah, Terah being the father of whom? Abraham, right? So we have this parallel description between 10 generations from Adam to Noah, and then 10 generations from Noah to Terra. Interesting. You have also the, the aspect of sin and justice as an intervention 
from God as a result of sin or corruption. So in Genesis chapter 6, we have the sons of God marry the daughters of men. We've spoken about that. The result is what? Flood, right? Then in Genesis chapter 11, we have sin as a result of that divine intervention, divine justice. And at the Tower of Babel, that is manifested through the confusion that God creates and spreading them all over the earth, as opposed to their desire to go upwards and reach God. Right? Interesting. So then, if you go to the entire story of Genesis 1 through 11, which is called proto-history. Proto-history meaning proto, which means first or starting. Proto-history. Proto-history is the first history of humanity, the starting history of humanity. And obviously, in Genesis 1 through 11, that's what we have. It starts with the creation account, and then we have the moment where humanity is again spread all over the face of the earth. So here is the parallelism. You have creation first, and then you have new creation in the case of Noah, right? Because the same description is made with the same language in both cases. You have water, dry land, humans, blessings, and food in both stories. Creation and new creation right after the flood. Then you have fall and new fall, same elements, eating, nakedness, being seen, nakedness, being covered, and then curse. You have genealogies in both cases, genealogy of Adam's three sons, and then genealogies of Noah's three sons. In both cases, you have 10 generations going down toward the Messiah. You have then corruption and divine justice, followed by the flood in the first part, and then followed by confusion and um, scattering in the second story. And in both cases, and I believe this is the most remarkable thing here, in both cases, both the first creation and the first fall story, and the second creation and second fall story, meaning the story of Noah and uh, the aftermaths of the flood, you have the direct line going down to the Messiah. So, genealogy goes from Adam through Seth all the way down to Noah, and then from Noah all the way down through Shem until we reach Abraham. And that story we'll start looking at next Sabbath. <laughs> all the way down on your page, you have a very interesting structure from Genesis chapter 10. Please notice the order. Shem, Ham or Ham, and Japheth. Right? Shem, Ham, and Japheth. That's the order in which the three sons appear whenever they are mentioned one after the other. But then when you look at the description of their genealogies, the first son to be described is not Shem. Who is it? It's Japheth. And then follows who? Ham. And the last one is Shem. Why? For the same reason that I have uh, pointed out many, many times is because of the chiastic structure. You have Shem, Ham, Japheth, and you have Japheth, Ham, Shem. Does that make sense? Now, there is a conversation, a, a debate actually, with regard to the biological order of these sons. It's pretty obvious to some 
researchers that Shem is not the youngest and is not the oldest either. The youngest seems to be Ham. Chapter 9, verse 24 says, So Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. Now, some say it's younger, it's not youngest. So he may be younger than one of the other two. Then, if you go to 1021, 1021, and children were born also to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder. So Japheth is elder than whom? Than Shem. Nevertheless, the other translation says, the elder brother of Japheth, which is the exact flip of it, right? So what I'm trying to point out is the text, because it's an old text and uh, pretty short and cryptic, can be taken both ways. But what I see here in the chiastic structure is that Shem is always placed at the beginning, most probably for the same reasons why Judah, you know Judah, one of the sons of whom? Of Jacob. Even if he's not the firstborn, because who's the firstborn? Reuben. And yet, many times he's mentioned as being the first, Judah. Why? Because he's the one that carries on the line of the Messiah. So for the same reason I see Shem placed here most probably not the eldest. And Japheth seems to be the eldest based on this chiastic structure. Nevertheless, based on the text, it's not easy to demonstrate that. I want us to go a little bit through the genealogies. This is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And sons were born to them after the flood. Obviously, the three were born before the flood. They survived the flood, and now they start procreating. Okay? And then it says, it starts with Japheth. That can be one of the reasons why we should take him as being the eldest. It starts with Japheth. Then it goes to Gomer. The sons of Japheth were Gomer. Herodotus, that's a Greek historian, connects Gomer with Crimea. You know where Crimea is? A few years back, there was a conflict between Russia and Ukraine because of the Crimean Peninsula. Okay? So it seems that that's the area where originally these uh, Gomerians lived. Now, we, we have to understand something very interesting here. Moses describes these genealogies later on, right? So when he describes the genealogies, history is already happening. It did not start where Moses is. So he describes history retroactively. So based on the situation that Moses knows in his time under the illumination of the Holy Spirit, he describes the situation from the past, meaning that the names that Moses uses here for those people groups and ethnic groups are names that are known in his time. These are not necessarily the names we know today. So when we try to see who's who here, what ethnic groups stemmed out of those people groups, is some sort of approximation there are names where we have relative certainty. But in most cases, it's pretty fluid. Because we cannot go back and check exactly, not to mention that migration and uh, moving from one 
territory to the other happened in those days too, just like today. If you want to trace down everybody here in America, you will have a hard time, right? But let's go back. Japheth, Gomer, Magog. Magog, some say, are behind the Russian people, especially southern Russia, Georgia. Um, the Scythians came from uh, Magog. Madai, the Medes, the Medes, Asia, right? East. And some say that the Medes are also the ancestors of the Indians. Okay? Then Javan. Here we have relative certainty. Javan is an old historic name for Greece. Javan or Ionia, that's Greece. Tubal, Tobolsk, there's a city in Russia, Tobolsk. Meshech, some say it's behind Moscow. The name Moscow comes from Meshech. Tyrus, Thracians. Thracians, some historians say the area where I am from was um, inhabited by Thracians back in history. The sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, you know the Jews that are coming from Germany call themselves Ashkenazi Jews, which means that Germany is associated with Ashkenaz. And some say Scandinavia, Ashkenaz, Scandinavia is also related to that name. Rifath, Carpathians, Ripath, Carpath, Carpathians, that's the mountains in Romania and with a little extension in Ukraine. Togarmach, Armach, some say Armenians stem from Togarmach. So all these are descendants of Japheth. And Turkey, some parts of Turkey may be covered by the same kind of population. And then the sons of Javin are described. Among them, there is one called Kittim. It's associated with Cyprus and the islands around Cyprus. And uh, Rhodes or Rhodos is associated with Rodanim, Rodanim. Very interesting. Most researchers say that Japheth and his descendants are more toward Europe and then toward India. That's why there is a group of languages called Indo-European languages, Indo-European languages. All right, Ham. The sons of Ham were Cush, and Cush is identified in the Bible several times as Ethiopia. Now, it's very interesting that these are in the south. If the mountain where the ark stopped is the Mount Ararat that is known today, that's a mountain somewhere in between Armenia, Turkey, and Iran. So from there, Ham went south through Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula, and then all the way down to northern Africa because Ethiopia is always identified by Kush. From there, there's a story of Nimrod going toward Babylon because he was the one that built Babel. Right? You can find that here in uh, chapter 10, starting with verse 8. Also, Nineveh, built by the same Nimrod. So we have Assyria hinted upon, the land of Shinar, same territory. Then you have Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim is Egypt. It's identified in the Bible. Put, that's Libya, not Lydia, Libya, and also the Sabaeans, some say. And Canaan, or Canaan, is the branch of Ham that lived in Canaan, the space, the territory that was occupied later on by the Israelites. 
coming out of Egypt. The point is, Ham is in the south, northern Africa, and uh, the fertile crescent. From Mitzrayim, we know the Philistines came, uh, or the Philistines came from Mitzrayim. The Kephtarim are mentioned, Crete, the Cretans. And that's, again, in Europe, stemmed from the Kephtarim, some say. It's possible via migration. But then look at Shem. Shem, the first child mentioned here is Eber, although we don't think Eber is the firstborn, but Eber is mentioned because through Eber, the genealogy goes down toward Abraham and then the Messiah. But the sons of Shem are Elam, Elam, that's Persia, in the area of the old Persia. Susa, it's a city in Elam. Ashur, Assyria, the same area where, where Nimrod went to build a city. Arpakshad, Lud, Lud is behind Lydia, that's in Asia Minor, Turkey today. Arpakshad is the son through whom the Messiah comes because Eber is not direct son of Shem. He's one of the grandsons. Aram, Aram that's Syria, that's behind the language Aramaic, Syria. And then we have uh, Uz, Uz, seem to be in Arabia. That's where Job was called from. That's where Job lived, actually. Arpakshad begot Shela. Salah begot Eber. You have Peleg at one point there. Peleg, those seem to be the ancestral inhabitants of the Greek islands. Yoktan is mentioned and some other names very difficult to identify. By the way, I just want to point this out. In verse 17 in chapter 10, there is a name, Sinite. Some say that's the ancestor of the Chinese people. Chino, Sino, China, Sinites. Quite possible. And now, go to Genesis chapter... 11. Genesis chapter 11, that the description of the Tower of Babel. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. The previous chapter says that Nimrod, was behind the project of Babel, right? Then they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had bricks for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Remember, God said they should spread, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So this goes against God's command. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and dare confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Interesting, come, let us go down. The same way that you find God speaking in Genesis chapter 1, 26, let us make man, okay? So, it's a plural, plural of Elohim, let us. 
okay? So then they are spread all over the face of the earth. This Babel description, of course, happens before the scattering or before the division of the earth that happened in the day of Peleg. Peleg was one of the sons of uh, Eber. And that's when it says in verse 25, chapter 10, for in his days the earth was divided. So there was a point in which the descendants of Noah somehow divided the earth among themselves. It seems that Ham went south, Japheth went uh, west from where they were at that time, and Shem went east. Of course, the Israelites are Shemites or Semites. That's where the name or the, the word anti-Semitic comes from. You know what anti-Semitism or anti-Semitism is, okay? It's not only against the Jews, it's against all descendants of Shem. But here's a big question for us, especially for us living in America, the natives of America, north and south. Where are they coming from? And there are all kinds of approximations. Some say North American indigenous people came from Shem, South Americans, because they are south in the area of Africa, came from Ham, or Ham, and uh, also from Ham, the aboriginal populations of Australia and some of the islands in those areas. I think what the Bible says is pretty clear. That all the humans, after the flood, stemmed out somehow from these three guys. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. What's very interesting, if you count the number of the names mentioned in this genealogy in chapter 10, because then we have another genealogy in chapter 11 that is just the direct line from Shem to Abraham. But in chapter 10, if you count the names, it's 70 names. 70 names? It's like suggesting, yeah, it's the complete picture and this will cover everything. Pretty crazy, right? It's your turn. If I have difficulties telling you or writing down the names of 70 people from the church, then how was Moses able to write down 70 names and not only that, tell you the stems of all those people, how they relate to one another, uh, which comes from Ham, which comes from Shem, which comes from uh, Japheth? That's a great question. There are two, two elements here. One is oral tradition. Oral tradition was very strong in those days, still. It still is in some cultures today. In some cultures, that's one of the most important things you are to focus on as a young fellow, to count and know the names of all of your ancestors. So, oral tradition. Second, we have no certainty that there was no written tradition at that time already. Remember, before Moses flew to the wilderness, <laughs> because he had to uh, leave Egypt, otherwise they would have probably executed him because of what he did there. But before that, he was the pharaoh in line. He would have become a pharaoh in all likelihood. So that means if there was any kind of education, higher education in those days, which I'm sure they had, then he had access to that. And uh, if you had any kind of library in those days, I'm pretty sure a library in Egypt would contain all the resources 
available at that time. Because even later, Egyptians, they had libraries that were the biggest, the greatest in those days. So he could have easily had some sort of access to information. Plus, count in the fact that Moses wrote under the influence, the direct influence of the Holy Spirit. So if he didn't know the names, the Holy Spirit could still tell him the names. It was under the influence of the Holy Spirit that the prophets, and Moses is one of them, wrote their writings. I hope that helps. Good question, good question. So, you know, there is a uh, verse in chapter 10. In chapter 10, verse 8 and then 9. Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. So the question was, did that mean that he was favored by God or, or God liked the fact that he was a great hunter? Was that ratified by God? Most translations kind of give that impression. Because in most translations that I could see, the simple wording is, and Nimrod was a mighty or great hunter before the Lord. As if it was all right for him to be the one he was. Nevertheless, there are translations, few, I have to admit, that suggest that the right translation should be and he was a mighty hunter against the Lord. And that makes more sense. Why? Because if he is behind the building project of Babel and Nineveh later on, I believe it would be a much better translation to say Nimrod was a mighty hunter against the Lord. It makes more sense, yes. So the question is, if you look in chapter 10, you read about those nations, each with their language. So it's obvious that at that time, there are different languages already. But then you move one page in chapter 11, verse 1. It says, now the whole earth had one language and one speech. So are then 10 and 11 chronological? Well, yes and no. Let me explain how. Again, Moses writes retroactively. And there's a way of writing retroactively. You can see it even at the creation account. The creation account first, in chapter 1, the first creation account, gives you the whole picture, the full picture of all the six plus one, seven days. That's chapter 1 plus the first three and half of verse 4 in chapter 2. Then, in chapter 2, it's like it goes back and expands on some elements that have been listed in chapter 1. For instance, in chapter 1, all we find out about the creation of man is that God made man, husband and wife, male and female, into his image, right, in his likeness. But we don't know how that was made. In chapter 2, it goes back and expands on it. And it tells you exactly how God took Adam, soil, and shaped Adam. Because it's the same word. So he took soil and shaped the man called soil from the soil. And then <laughs> breath in his nostrils, breath of life. So you have the story and then you have expansion on the story. Similarly over here, first Moses gives you a big picture of the nations. You have uh, the three sons, out of the three sons of Noah stemmed all those nations, all the 70 nations that he lists. That covers everything, that's the picture. And then in 11, he comes back and says, okay, now let me explain how that happened. 
right? Just the way in Genesis 1 and 2 you have this happened. Humans were created. Let me now explain how humans were created. First Adam and then Eve. And over here you have, this is what the story is, the three stems of Noah. Out of them came all those other people and their languages. And then he says, okay, let me now explain to you how it happened. Initially, they had the same language. Communication was perfect. Then something happened, a project against God, spearheaded by Nimrod, the hunter, mighty hunter against God. Okay, something happened. Things went south. And what God told them to do from the beginning now is happening not because they wanted to, but because they had to, because God mixed up their languages. It's interesting that later on in the book of uh, Acts, Acts chapter 2, you have a reversal of uh, the confusion and scattering of the languages when on the day of Pentecost, all those nations that are together to celebrate Pentecost in Jerusalem, they are able to listen to the preaching of the gospel, each understanding it in his or her own language. So there is a, a light motive that goes on in Scripture. So chronological in the sense that you have first the three sons of Noah and then the branches, but non-chronological in the sense that you have the big picture and then expansion of that big picture. Excellent question. So how do you explain the three races? You know, there's all kind of um, historical nonsense <laughs> regarding the origins of the races. And uh, when I grew up, I was in Eastern Europe, of course, I was kind of taught that there are three races, the white, the yellow, and the black. And it's in that order, meaning we are the strongest, the wisest, the best. And then the yellow, and then the black. And that's a stereotype that is still out there in society. Now, if it's true that Japheth is behind most Indo-European populations, then probably more light-skinned people belong to the stem of Japheth than any other stem. If it's true that uh, Shem went east, Abraham came from the east, and he came to Canaan, and then he went down to Egypt. And then he came back to Canaan. And then his descendants went down to Egypt. And then when Joseph's brothers went down to Egypt, they saw Joseph. And they didn't realize Joseph was so much different than the Egyptians. It means that their skin colors were pretty close unless Joseph was so painted on his face that he couldn't see, hey, this is, this is more light color than, than the other people here. What I'm trying to get to is that there is this presupposition that um, Jesus was a very light, blue eyes fellow, which is false. He clearly was a Middle Eastern, Middle Eastern, right? And... Um, he, he clearly came from the Jews, and the Jews, most of them are not very light-skinned. Of course, those that are now repopulated back into Israel, mostly coming from Europe, the Sephardi and Ashkenazi Jews, they were mixed with the local populations as well. But the descendants of Shem do not seem to be very light color. That's just a historical fact. And then Ham. 
ham seems to be mostly in Africa. But then there is a branch of ham, the Canaan or Canaan or Canaan branch that is in the Fertile Crescent. All are Hamites dark complexion? Hard to say. So what I'm trying to get to is we are so mixed up that we don't know who is who. This three race theory I think is arbitrary. Some people bring it back to Noah and his sons, saying Noah had three sons, one was black, one was white, and one was yellow. That's crazy, because it leaves out huge populations. If the three races are white, yellow, and um, black, where do you put all those that are in between? Because most people are in between. Uh, in my view, uh, the conversation, the racial conversation, especially the one that is happening in America, is very biased. It carries on uh, stereotypes. It makes it black and white and leaves everybody out, everybody else out. That's not correct, because in America, it's not only black and white. Then again, there's a stereotype with regard to Christianity being a white religion. That's false too, because first of all, the Israelites were not white. They are Shemites. So most of the protagonists in the Bible are not Jephetites, they are Shemites. And uh, if you look in the Bible, there's a lot of mentioning about Africans in the Bible, maybe even more than about descendants of Japheth. I want to reaffirm everybody's uniqueness and special fabric, ethnic fabric. There's no superiority or inferiority just because you are lighter or darker in skin. Is the same blood in everybody? Yes. Thank you. Good question. What was so bad about Noah's nakedness? Not the nakedness itself, but the way Ham reacted to his nakedness that brought about the curse that hit Canaan who is not even a son. He is a grandson of Ham. The short answer is we don't know exactly why the curse hit Canaan. It's pretty obvious that it did because the Canaanites later on became that group of people that were dislocated by the Jews coming from Egypt. And that all happened under divine guidance. So something was really bad there. The question is then, the curse of Noah that hit Canaan was a predestination kind of curse? Or was it a prophetic insight that Noah had after he woke up from his drunkenness and that prophetic insight allowed him to say something specific about Canaan or the Canaanites? What was so bad about Ham's attitude? Hard to say because it's not Ham that was punished by the curse. It was one of his descendants. If you just look at his act of lack of respect, because in ancestral societies and in biblical society, you as a parent, you don't want to uncover your nakedness in front of your child. And you as a child, you don't want to uncover the nakedness of your parent. That is abomination to the Lord. So it really entails some sort of a, a respect issue. The other two come and go backwards. So that clearly shows some sort of a respectful attitude toward their father. So based on that, Ham's gesture seems to be lack of respect. 
how it jumps from Ham and hits Canaan, that's a very difficult thing to say. The Bible specifies that the sins of the parents are punished in the children. You have that even in the Decalogue. Up to a third or fourth generation, right? Is that clear? And grace or God's mercy, divine mercy, is manifested up to a thousand generations. Whatever that means, if Canaan is cursed because of Ham's sin, it's within the biblical frame of reality in which the parent's sin can be punished in the children if they follow in the footstep of uh, the parent. If they do not follow that kind of uh, course of action, if they turn back to the Lord, then the other law, the 1,000 generation, applies. Let me illustrate this. We have uh, a father that has four children, like in my family. My father was famous about doing this kind of sin. And uh, all four of us are descendants of my father. Because of the sin of my father, there's a certain kind of curse. Curse being a direct consequence of sin. It's very hard to prove that curse is an arbitrary action of God. No, curse is a direct consequence of some sort of sin. So all four of us carry on the DNA of my father. Does that mean that all four of us will be cursed because of the sinfulness or the patterns of sinfulness established by my father? Not necessarily, because some of us may continue that line and then it goes all the way down to third or fourth generation. But if those descendants turn back to the Lord, then the law of mercy all the way down to a, a thousand generation applies, which we have never reached a thousand generation. Because that's another way to say it goes all the way into eternity. Exactly. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. May your spirit continue stirring our hearts and minds and uh, place our eyes upon Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Because that's the most important thing here, that the line of the Messiah continues. We thank you so much. In his name, amen.